yourself. Uh, because I believe a couple of things that nobody wants to admit. I, I still think the majority of theft of this type of data is not from computer type losses. I, I don't know if I'm the only one who believes that or not, but I still think that the majority of these types of theft is inside jobs. Um, and so at the same time when you think, okay, here's another un uh, unfunded mandate, you're also concerned about are they really solving the core issue of, of this. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to talk about that today. That's a discussion of politics for another day. So we'll stick to the topic at hand. So anyway, uh, going to the next slide, right? Why is laptop encryption so important? I think I just covered that um, pretty clearly. Uh, so what we're going to do, what Tim is going to do mostly, and we'll, fi we'll field questions at the end, obviously, is he's going to talk to you about a couple of different uh, programs that we looked at uh, for deploying uh, encryption to our computers in our environment. And, uh, and I hope he's going to discuss some of the issues that we've had with it uh, and some of, um, you know, all of that, that, those types of aspects. How many times do you think I can say that? So anyway, uh, next slide, Tim, right? Which is, who should have encrypted drives? I, I think really we're going to say everyone. And, and the reason why is because at some point in everybody's career, there's a chance that they might come across data that is considered protected data. The, the other interesting thing is that I, I also find amusing the classification of what data is considered important or what data is you know, not considered important. And that seems to change too. So even though today you might have a user who has data on their laptop that might not be considered confidential data, if in two years time that data all of a sudden becomes confidential data, uh, are you going to make sure that you revisit that? So one thing that you might want to consider doing is uh, encrypting or, or providing encryption technologies before you deliver a laptop to a user. Uh, you know, and, and then making sure that the data streams and, and paths, you know, data accesses that they have do not include confidential data unless they absolutely need it. Uh, I know one thing that my university was guilty of up until a couple of years ago was that they uh, gave social security numbers to every faculty member for every student in their classes. It was on our roster. So I don't know how many other schools <coughs> have done that in the past, but you know, a good thing to note is, um, for instance, uh, I, I know other of my colleagues on campus are dealing with this, is that they have some uh, faculty members who've been faculty members for 20 years. And every time they get a new computer, they just copy all of their files over from their previous computer. What does that mean? That means that they have faculty members who have probably thousands and thousands of social security numbers on their laptops, even from a technology that is no longer being used. So you can't just say, oh, only the deans need it, only the clinical staff need it, because there's a good chance that faculty have old files. I mean, we have faculty members who have files with 1992 dates, 1993 dates, uh, and everything else. I'm sure you do too. Uh, so. You know, obviously, you, you really need to look at everybody, not just high-profile individuals. Uh, and, you know, the, the other honest answer is somebody was telling me before we came in here that they recently had someone who had a laptop stolen. I, I mean, l l the honest answer, again, like I said before, is that the person stealing that laptop was probably not stealing that laptop to get Social Security numbers. They were stealing that laptop to take to the local pawn shop, you know, to turn around and sell. You know, there's this great fear that, the, you know, if people are stealing laptops and everything, but I don't think that that is the main issue. So, um, but of course, nobody wants to lose a laptop and have confidential data on it and then have to go public, start contacting people and everything else. Quick question. Um, do, does Rutgers have any policies on what data can be stored where? Um, and you define something. Oh, it, uh, yes, absolutely, of course. But as we all know, that doesn't mean really that much of anything. Because, uh, you know, who's going to determine, uh, you know, does anyone here scan all of their user files on their, their personal laptops, their personally owned computers, to determine if they have social security numbers on it? We will be. You will be. Yeah. So, so you, you'll say, on, not on a university owned system or law school owned system. You're going to go and say, bring in your home computer. On student oh. systems? No, no. no. Oh, well, are you referring to personally owned computers sure. that are owned at home by faculty and yes. staff? 
we, there's no way you we can tell, do that. No, we're not. I mean, but, well, listen, I mean, we can't control them in terms of they want to take some PII home, they're going to do that. Exactly. But it's against so university said, policy. So, right. It's yeah. obviously against university policy, yeah. you know. But, but the question is, when was it against university policy? <laughs> no, no, seriously. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's Very what I, I was hoping to yeah. illustrate is that you, you have a lot of people who have files that are, are decades old. That, uh, you know, they might not even, and, and the important thing is that I, I'm not trying to say they're willfully doing this. What I'm trying to say is that there's a pretty good chance that they have no idea. You know, that they're not even thinking in their mind, I've got this file on my computer from 20 years ago that has, you know, 200 social security numbers. Uh, and especially when some of you are, you, you know, what I always find interesting is that I think most of us have had celebrities come through our schools. So if you, if you think about the data that you have on these people, it's kind of very interesting. So anyway, I, I, I think that's it for me, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, th that's it for me for now. So uh, I'll, I'll let Tim take over. Uh, I, you know, at the end, I would like to talk more about uh, some of these disclosure <coughs> issues and, and rules and regulations uh, if you're interested. So uh, thank you, and let's turn it over to Tim. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim. I also obviously work at Rutgers Law School in Camden. Um, just, just to give you an example of how committed we are to the uh, encrypting our laptops, our dean has an encrypted laptop. Um, and that's very interesting because his encrypted laptop died and we had to, on the dean's laptop, test all of these wonderful emergency decryption processes and all these kind of wonderful things. Um, so I really have a lot of experience with, with uh, both of these programs. Um, we wanted to uh, give you uh, you know, a few examples of the, of the program. There's, there's hundreds of, of uh, paid encryption softwares out there that you could purchase anywhere from 20 or $30 a pop to a couple thousand for, you know, your organization. But, uh, you know, we kind of have a open source as kind of a theme for our, our, uh, our group. So, uh, you know, we just picked the two free ones. Um, they both are, are very good and they have their own little, um, you know, distinctions. So going to uh, illustrate them each. Um, so both of them, uh, the two that we're talking about, CompuSec and uh, TrueCrypt's full hard drive encryption, uh, are, are both free. Uh, you can download them. Uh, they do on-fly uh, hard disk encryption for the entire disk uh, or particular partition if you wanted to just use a single partition on your drive. Um, they do pre-boot authentication, so if you, you, go, you before you can access the files, you have to boot into the system and put in a password or a username and password uh, before you can get access to the files. Um, they both have emergency decryption kinds of things. If, if Windows starts to flake out, uh, as it did on the Dean's computer, and you need to uh, redo everything, uh, there's ways to do that, and it's, again, free. Um, so we're going to start with, with uh, CompuSec. Um, the thing to remember with CompuSec is that it's, it's a free program that's, that they want you to use and then buy all their other stuff. So there are some things in the system that you, that you, you think like, why are they doing that? And like, oh, because they want you to buy something else to go along with the free system. Uh, so it's not, it's the, but the, the program itself is free. It does everything you would need. It just has a lot of other things you have to uh, either install or not install. Um, but uh, CompuSec also has this e-identity system, which is kind of like an RSA key, kind of a, a thing you'd carry around with you. Um, you can install on these pre-boot uh, dual authentication with, uh, you know, biometric scanners, and they have this uh, this CompuSec mobile thing, which is like a PCMCA card that you put in that if you don't have the card in the laptop, you can't use the laptop, that kind of stuff. Um, and then they have this thing here, which is global admin which is really the coolest thing about CompuSec. Um, what they're marketing their system for is for this kind of a global, we're going to encrypt all of your, all of your computer system. So you purchase this for um, five to $10,000, depending on how many people you have. We didn't do this, by the way. Um, and uh, what it will do when you first install the system, it'll say, are you installing it from a global admin system? You say yes. All the settings are on the global admin system. It just, everything else just does its thing and it's a lot easier than install. Um, that also comes into play with encryption keys. We'll get into a second because then you can remotely set the keys and you don't have to worry about um, going through that. So uh, CompuSec is free again, obviously. 
Uh, it works on Windows 2000, XP, and they just released Vista about a month ago. Uh, it also has Linux support for um, you know, any um, Linux distributions. Uh, it does not do Mac, but um, as Tom mentioned, I should mention, um, Macs come with, the new version of Macs come with Bit Vault. that's what it's called. Um, it does the same thing, it's already in the system, and I would just use that. I do use that, actually, so there you go. Um, uh, the, when you download the system, it comes with all sorts of additional um, options. You can have a single sign-on, so when you first um, put your username and password into the system, it'll also propagate that through Windows, and you can go on and sign on to any websites and do all sorts of stuff, kind of like a, like a robo-form kind of a password um, saving <laughs> system. Um, it also does uh, encryption of CDs, so if you are running a global admin or you do what we do, which is share the different keys between all the laptops, um, you can actually burn an encrypted CD, take that, put it in another computer that has CompuSec installed, and it'll read it, but if you don't have <laughs> CompuSec installed, it's just nonsense. Uh, and floppies and USB <coughs> keys and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can encrypt single files if you want to send just a specific file, encrypt it and send it to somebody through email. Um, it has the safe LAN feature uh, where you can set it up so if you have a network storage, um, you know, mounted drive that you want to go and, you know, if you use that on your network, uh, then you can use CompuSec to, to encrypt everything on the network. Um, and it has this VoIP uh, encryption software if you're running some kind of uh, VoIP setup on your computer, it'll encrypt it, but I haven't really gone into that. Um, so what type of encryption? We have no idea. Uh, even though CompuSec is free, it's wholeheartedly closed source. So you do have to trust that they're encrypting it well. But um, you know, I haven't heard any complaints. I did a lot of research on the company. I, you know, I haven't heard anyone say, "Oh my God, it's so easy to break the laptop encryption." Um, but you know, you never know. There is some chance later on down the line you go with the system, and you know, some flaw happens. You have to quickly upgrade all your systems. Um, and like I said, the global admin, so you can, uh, once you install Windows and you want to encrypt the laptop, uh, you can just go in and um, do the global admin. Another thing to note on this and most of the other um, encryption softwares is that if you're, if you're ghosting images of encrypted um, hard drives, it, there's, they both come with special instructions on exactly how to, to image a drive. Uh, you can't just do a normal image. You have to, at least in Ghost, I don't know about Alteris or some of the others, you have to set all these kinds of flags because it has to pull every single bit off the drive. If you're missing one bit that it, it needs, then, you know, it's hosed. So what are you doing? Are you, are you, just, are you doing it through Ghost when you do your images? Or are you, are oh, you, are uh, you just right going through the encryption after the fact? Right now we're doing the encryption after the fact because we haven't really... We haven't really given too many laptops out brand new to people. So right now it's, give me your laptop, I need to encrypt it and I'll hand it back to you. So we're not really imaging them. We're just putting the encryption on. Um, there's a couple install screens from the system. Uh, these are all the wonderful different options. Obviously you need to keep the authentication there and the hard disk encryptions. Um, single sign-on, safe LAN, you know, all these other things, identity management, DVD encryption. These are all things that you can install or not. Um, and then these are the authentication methods. So if I spent money and had all these other kinds of wonderful things, their e-identity system, which is like the, the RSA little key things, um, fingerprint scans, all this stuff, you can do uh, different kinds of authentication when you turn the laptop on. It's not just single document. Uh, you put your username in, you can set, if people have to uh, reset their passwords, how long they expire, um, all these types of things. Um, you also put in a reset code, which is, an absolutely beautiful thing. If the uh, professor or dean or whoever uh, forgets their password and you need to help them reset it, um, otherwise you have major issues. Um, you know, this is one of the, the really key features of CompuSec. You can input your own encryption keys. Um, you can have it set random keys if you want to, click that those things a billion times if you want, or you can do what we do, and you can enter them in manually, or you can get them on disk. So the encryption CD that I have has the, the software files installed on the CD, and then it also has our security file, which has a list of all of these keys. 
Uh, the problem would be that if we have had 50 laptops and they were all encrypted, we would have to keep master copies of every single uh, security CD from every single laptop. Um, and you know we don't want them to get mixed up or whatever. I also have the ability to take now this laptop that was encrypted with our, these aren't our keys by the way, just to be clear, um, take our laptops with this, these keys on them, put them in another computer that I have already set up, as, uh, put it in as a slave, and get files off the, off the, um, the system if I, if I need to. So we don't have to go through the process of uh, you know, decrypting the drive and doing all sorts of stuff at the laptop dock, <coughs> and we need to just transfer the files over. Um, and then the CD, uh, when you install it, it asks you if you want to just pick one of these predefined keys, there's eight of them there, um, or we just have our own, and we just support that as well. Um, God awfully long, let me tell you. <laughs> 40, 40 gig drives, not that bad. 80 drives, just set it before you leave and come back the next day. It takes forever. Um, but it, what it's doing is encrypting every single byte on the drive. Uh, so it's not like you're, if you have a 100 gig drive and you only have two gigs available, it doesn't matter. It's encrypting every bit on the drive so none of it's readable. So it takes forever. Um, one of the other cool features about CompuSec is that it has a, uh, you can customize how the login screen works. So it's really nice if you're, if you're looking for a professional kind of install. Um, this is what it really originally looks like, and this is where you would you know, put your username and password in when the, when the system first comes up, and uh, yeah, like that. My lovely uh, pictures. Um, but what we do is we've changed the login screen so it looks at least a little more university presentable, although we've changed our logo, I guess, three times since that, but you know, we're getting there. <laughs> Um, so it really, it looks a lot better, more professional install than the, you know, CompuSec, you know, logos in front. Um, does anyone have any CompuSec questions before I get into the other? Yes, sir. Is there a performance uh, difference between non-encrypted laptop and encrypted one? Um, there is definitely a performance dip. If you have a, you know, a brand new Core 2 Duo, Intel, you know, whatever, couple gigs of RAM, you don't see it. Um, there, we do have professors that have old um, P3, P4 laptops that we can't use because it just won't, it's too slow. I mean, the company says it'll work on anything, but it's, it's too slow. But if you have anything less than, we've seen four years old, uh, it works perfectly fine. You, you don't really, you can't really tell. Um, and that's with both um, TrueCrypt and Compass. What processor speed would you say is the threshold for what you would consider using it on versus not? I would say um, it's 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 not necessarily just the processor speed. Um, processors, you know, anything better than a, a P4 would be fine. The problem is you need um, extra RAM because it's it's when when it's reading the hard disk, it's it's reading the section of the disk, decrypting it. Sending it to the to the motherboard or whatever, then sending it back and then re-encrypting it and sending it forward. So it just it takes a lot of time and a lot of RAM to do that. So I, you know I don't I wouldn't want to put it on anything that has you know Windows XP less than a gig of RAM kind of situation. Um, and then of course at laptop hard drives uh, you know are traditionally a little slower. Um, you know if I, I have it on a desktop and it works uh, you know really good, but. So if you have a slower RPM drive, that might affect it as well. Um, okay, so now we go to TrueCrypt, which I'm sure uh, a lot of you are familiar with the... Um, yes, oh, I'm sorry. How does it deal with backup system? I mean, the, um, you have backup system in your institution, I assume, and how does it understand the encryption? Backup of, of the oh, data? data? Well, yeah. once, you, once you boot into... Uh, once you sign in and you boot into Windows, you treat it just like a normal computer. So your backup policies on the network or whatever you want to do are, are that. So we don't, we, don't, we don't back up the image of the drive. Just, we just have the users you know, use our network storage that has you know, lots of backup and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you also encrypt desktop or you only encrypt laptops? We currently are only encrypting laptops, only the, other than the one that I, that I have and I use for um, you know, helping to users with their drives. But it's certainly, 
in the realm of possibilities. We just haven't taken that, that step yet. Yes? Uh, does it answer the fall pathway then, fall time, it like locks it out? Or you just it doesn't lock you out, but you can't do anything. It, 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 it's not like one of those programs that, that if you hit it more than five times, it wipes the whole hard drive or, or anything like that. Um, but you, you can't do anything. It doesn't make you pass that first log once. Correct. <coughs> yeah, you can't. And, you know, it's the whole point, right? If you yank the hard drive out and stick it into somebody else's computer or whatever, you can't do anything with it either unless you have a computer set up already with the encryption keys preloaded. Okay. Um, so TrueCrypt, um, a lot of people <coughs> in, in the industry use it for um, encrypting files and things. Uh, in their latest version, they released uh, a um, system for uh, full disk encryption, which is something that people have been waiting for for a while. Um, so TrueCrypt is, is absolutely open source, so there's, there's a, you know, depending on your feelings on the topic, there's, there's a level of trust that you can or cannot associate with that. Um, but you know all of the documentation. It's very inten uh, intensive documentation, so you can certainly look up how it works, why it works, all that fun stuff. Um, you also, with TrueCrypt, have your choice of what kind of um, encryption algorithms you want to use. If you have a preference, if you know you trust one more than the other, um, things of that nature. Um, the, the difference with TrueCrypt is that it's, it's, its original purpose was to encrypt uh, files and not necessarily encrypt entire partitions or entire drives. So the original install for TrueCrypt is quick. It's two things, you just install it, you hit yes, it's fine, it's done, and you're installed. And then you can, this is the main TrueCrypt screen, and you can um, mount different volumes, um, you can make new drives, all that kind of stuff. Um, which is what TrueCrypt normally does. Um, what they want you to do now, well, what you can do now, is go up to the tools function and there's a setting for full hard disk encryption, which is this first area here. And you can do uh, a few different things. You can just, if you have a, a, a Windows and Linux partition boot on your drive and you want to just encrypt the Windows side, you can just encrypt, encrypt specific partitions. Um, or if you want to do the whole drive, you can do that as well. Um, it will do, it, it has a lot of support for multi-boot systems, so if you have a couple of different partitions and you want to boot between them, uh, when you, after you put in your TrueCrypt password, it will just ask you what, um, what partition, kind of like the Windows screen that comes up. Um, and once again, all the uh, encryption tests and things. Um, what I wanted to point out is that TrueCrypt decided to do a completely random key generation. So every single laptop that you install with TrueCrypt en encryption is different from every other laptop you have. So it, it's kind of cool though, but you, when you uh, move your mouse around, it, it, it takes the mouse information and just changes the encryption key. Um, but you have to be careful when you're doing this that if you lose the, 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 the disk, the rescue disk that comes with it, uh, you know, you have a problem. Um, what they do is, it's CompuSec just gives you a little file, a security file that you have to store somewhere on a USB key, on a hard drive, on the network, somewhere. So if there's a problem, you take that file, you you use it. Uh, so with TrueCrypt, they actually give you, or they make you burn a disk. It creates an ISO on your desktop or wherever you put it. And you have to not just make the ISO, you have to physically burn the ISO to a disk put the disk back into the drive and let TrueCrypt read it, because otherwise it says, you haven't burned a disk, we're not gonna do anything else until you prove to us that we can fix anything if there's a problem. Um, which is a really good feature for individuals. Uh, if I was gonna set, you could recommend uh, to uh, a specific person if they wanted to encrypt their laptop, I would recommend TrueCrypt because you know it's, it's, it seems like it's a lot more foolproof than CompuSec, and there's a lot less settings that you have to worry about. Um, but if you're doing 50 or 100 laptops, it starts to become an issue when you have to keep all of these ISOs somewhere, just in case there's a problem, and then pull out that one CD that has the rescue disk. Um, because the disk also has the encryption keys and all that stuff, and that's how you would emergency decrypt it in an emergency if you had to get the data off. 
can you burn more than one rescue disk at that point, or are they? Well, uh, you have the ISO on your computer. So what it does is it, it makes the ISO, puts it on your desktop, and says, "We're not going to do anything now until you burn it." So at that point, you could burn ten copies of it if you wanted to. Give one to the user, put one in a closet somewhere, you know, whatever you'd want to do. <coughs> Um, and then what it does is a pretest. So once you everything's ready, you hit encrypt, and it will restart the computer. Um, you know, put the the login screen on. If it passes the authentication, then it'll go back and say, "Are you ready to encrypt?" Um, the default on TrueCrypt is to install the encryption while you're working on the laptop, which is a nice feature if you're still doing other things. Uh, you can say encrypt, it'll restart, and it'll encrypt it while you're working in Windows. Um, the downside is it takes um, you know, one and a half times as long, so with CompuSec you can also do this, but it, they, they say don't if you're doing a lot of hard drive intensive stuff. Um, so CompuSec's install, you know, if it's a six or seven hour process, it would take you know, nine or ten hours to do. Um, most hopefully none of us work ten hour days, so you know, just I, I recommend just doing it right before you leave, it's ready the next day. Um, and then this is the extent of the um, bootloader password for TrueCrypt. Uh, there's no customization, there's no pretty colors, there's no pictures, there's no nothing. Just enter your password. Um, to get, you can hit at eight if you want to for the repair options, if you have know your password. The only way to recover if you don't know your password is to physically put in that rescue disk for that particular laptop. And I've tried even, um, you know, trying other disks or whatever, it doesn't work. You have to have that because it has the encryption key in it. So if you don't have that disk, you can't do anything. Um, I've also tried to do a search on the disk to see if I could like find the encryption key or anything like that. I can't. It's 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 somewhere in there, crazy. Um, so that's it's nice that it's not, you know, the disk isn't just laying out there with the encryption in it. Um, but once you put that disk in that particular hard drive, uh, then you can decrypt it, you know, on the spot, or you know, they have other repair options. Um, so the difference is really with with CompuSec and TrueCrypt. Uh, CompuSec is really good with in, with uh, installing different keys or the same key with multiple laptops. Uh, so that your environment is really kind of set together and you don't have to worry about, oh, this person has this key, this person has this key. Um, and it's a lot easier to administer the same systems at once. Um, but you do have to deal with all the additional crap that they put on the computer, uh, or at least make sure you don't install it when it comes up. Um, and they, they have all sorts of things for encrypting CD, encrypting media and things. Um, TrueCrypt, you know, is, is open source, so, uh, you know, we consider that a high level of trust. Um, we think it's better for a lot of single user, you know, one-off installs. If we have a specific person that we wanted to do, I would also recommend TrueCrypt over CompuSec for someone that I wasn't, you know, directly supporting. If someone came up to me and said, "Oh, I want to encrypt my laptop," what would you recommend? Um, but I don't really think that it's it's ready for, um, you know, a, a business environment yet. Uh, but you know, they just this is the first release of the full disk encryption, so. You know, certainly down the line, if they they could certainly add to that. Um, and then I have a whole bunch of time on purpose for questions and for Tom to continue talking. <laughs> so, about the specifics of the of the of the software, does anyone have any questions? Uh, removable disk encryption is an extra cost item for the CompuSec. Removable? Oh no, it's uh, the all of the. Features that I showed you back on that slide with all the different options are all included in the free CompuSec. So it has the the safe LAN the, for uh, you know network encryption. It has uh, removable LAN storage for for CDs or floppies or USB keys. Um, that's uh, zip disks. So that's all included in the software. And to be fair, you can certainly do that with. Um, TrueCrypt as well. It's just not as, as seamless. You have to actually, uh, you know, construct a, a image file with TrueCrypt and then place that on a CD key or a, like a USB key. But for CompuSec, once you put the key in, it'll ask you if you want to encrypt it. If there's nothing on it, 
um, you just say yes, and then every time you plug in it in and out, it's already it already senses that it's an encrypted drive, and you can just read it. Uh, so it's a little easier, but you know, they both can do it. Yes. Have you ever had any trouble with it, like crashing the drives and if it, like, because we have a uh, we we use a product called PointSec, and if we have a drive that's kind of iffy, it's, the drive gets hosed. <laughs> Have you guys had any troubles with that at all? Or? Um, well, that's actually what happened with the Dean's laptop. We had to get him a new hard drive. Uh, so it did decrypt the drive enough for us to get the data off. Um, we did use another um, software package called SpinWrite. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, which basically uh, goes through. It's like $60 or something for a license, and it'll go through it and uh, look at every single one and zero on the hard drive and make sure everything's OK first. So I ran that and it kind of cleaned up the drive enough so we could get the data off of it. Uh, I decrypted it and then the second it did, I, you know, I got everything off and it worked fine. But, you know, I was crossing my fingers the whole time, so I did not want to be the one that screwed the Dean's laptop up. <coughs> yes, sir? If, if you're using the computer for things like video editing or anything like that, and you have huge files with it causing problems, uh, well, the, the, the um, software encrypts the entire drive, so it wouldn't necessarily be a problem with the volume of the amount. Uh, you may have an issue, uh, a performance issue that you would notice if you're, you know, rendering a video. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, you, I didn't get that far into, into performance because uh, we don't really have anyone that does that. Um, but I, I guarantee you, you'd have a, a performance hit. How bad of a hit it is, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't think it would be that bad if you have a you know a newer uh, Intel, you know, Cordero processor, a couple gigs of RAM, you should have problems. Yes. Um, how do how do you manage the I mean, how do the program encrypt new files to the computer? Uh, is there a way for the user to tell the program when to encrypt? Well, with both of them, they're encrypting the entire hard drive. So every bit that comes in and out of the hard drive is encrypted. So if you create a new file on the hard drive, it's already encrypted at that point. And that's, that's good not only for the files that you're creating, but all sorts of stuff on the drive that you are not, that don't know get created, temporary files and things that Windows just puts up there. All of that is encrypted. Um, so if you were just using a TrueCrypt volume, for example, that you had with all of your files in it, that doesn't really help you completely because if you put your password in a website somewhere in Internet Explorer, you know, it's there. Someone could find it at some point. Um, but when you do this, it's, it encrypts the entire drive, so you don't have the same kinds of issues. is you have to tell the, the, at least in Ghost, and that's what I've used to, to do it, you have to tell Ghost to image basically everything. You have to pull the, you know, the, the MBR, you know, you have to pull all the partitions and just basically say image every little one and zero on the drive. If you do those settings, and they both, uh, I found both of them had, had information on how to, how to image drives um, in, the, in the help section, then you can uh, very easily would, would, would transfer it. Right, I, but, but your hardware duplicator still uses software. So the question would be, does the hardware duplicator uh, in its software package, the embedded software that it uses, does it do a full you know, bu uh, bit for bit copy of one hard drive to the other? If it does, then obviously it would work, is what Tim is saying. Uh, if it doesn't, if your embedded software on your hardware the copier just pulls the volume, or whatever. Just pulls a volume let's say. I mean, let's say it's running embedded Ghost. I mean, do you honestly know what software it's running? Probably not, right? It's something you bought and you just hook it up. But it's not, a, you know, everything that's hardware has some embedded firmware. So the question is, is that embedded firmware on that piece of hardware doing a bit for bit copy? Maybe, yeah. Clone the drive to create encryption and then, then encryption after it. If I was making a hardware duplicator, you know, that people would consider software irrelevant, right? I would do a bit for bit copy. The easiest answer is try. try. What do you have in this? I don't know what that is. 
cis prep, right, you're gonna have to ask her. We know this admin in the back, but uh, I, I don't see any problems with cis prep. Do you, Ray? Actually, you never used it. We don't use cis prep? No. Oh, okay, I don't know. No, uh, I, I can't yeah. imagine. <laughs> Do you ever have any trouble with any other USB devices or anything? So we, in ours, once in a while, if you, if you have them plugged in on boot up, like cameras, it won't boot because it's trying to encrypt the camera. Mm -hmm. have, just have you had any troubles with any USB devices? Yeah. I, have I we ever I, gotten a complaint from a user? No. I've never had someone that, that came to us and say, you know, it's not working. And, you know, I, mean, we, I know that one of our professors that has it does all sorts of stuff with camera, she's got a, a phone that she plugs in all the time, all that stuff, so, you know, she's never come to me and said she had a problem, so. But I know that her kids use her laptop all the time for stuff, and, you know, that hasn't done anything either, so. I haven't had any problems. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, have you ever used it in conjunction with any file synchronization software? Uh, no. But it's important to note that the encryption becomes invisible to the operating system once you do the boot. You know, so it, it's not that, it, so if you're online and you're surfing in Windows Internet Explorer and there's some hack that gives some remote site access to your hard drive, this doesn't give you any protection. Right, so anything, any disk synchronization software that you run in Windows, anything like that would be transparent. So the OS ends up decrypting it essentially on the fly? I, I, I wouldn't say the OS. I, well, I would I mean, say there, there's two, at least uh, specifically with TrueCrypt, there's two um, factors that you deal with. The, the mass boot record has some mojo in it that, that gets to the first section. You put your password in and it starts the process. Once Windows turns on, there's a driver in Windows that takes over the encryption and the decryption process when it goes back to the This is designed more for handling like USB thumb. You know, if you have a thumb drive, you plug in or the right. or, or if you use that LAN storage attack feature and everything else. But, you know, there is no, if you use the uh, CompuSec for like Linux, let's say, <coughs> there is no Linux driver right. that's provided. You know, so the, the drivers that would, become, that would be prevalent in Windows and stuff would be for the additional features, not necessarily for the disk itself, the, disk itself, the use of the system. Your laptop is in standby or hibernate, and it's going. Then I guess this won't protect anything, right? Unless they have some feature that for standby. standby I, I don't think I can help you with hibernate. <coughs> they both do. So if you put the the computer in hibernate and then try to yank the drive out and and read it, you wouldn't be able to. Um, when you turn it back on, it hits the preboot authentication before it, it spins Windows back up. But if if it's in standby, I guess you're just out of luck. <laughs> But, but then you, you have to realize, too, that, you, you know, most people nowadays have passwords on their system. So even if you put it in standby, unless you, you know, configured your computer to not use a password, which can't imagine, you know, I'm sure there are people who do that, then they're probably not the ones who care about this encryption software. Right. Uh, but, you know, you turn it back on. If a thief was to get your laptop and turn it back on and see that there was a password, you know, I mean, what are the odds? I mean, are they going to get out their compressed air and freeze your RAM chip? and take it out and, and try to get your password and everything else, and, and no, you know. And even if they did that, they wouldn't recover. Now, we won't talk the FireWire hacks on Macs, right, to, to do that in real time, but uh, I don't know if I'm talking about stuff people don't know about. But a anyway, uh, I, I think you'd be fine, because most people would, if, if they were really, and this goes back to what I was saying before, do you really think that they're stealing your laptop to get your confidential data off of it, right? They're, they're probably but not. I guess as long as you make sure that the password prompt it is there. Like the, the workstation's locked when it's in standby, then, yeah. It's yeah, you'd standby. probably be fine. Yeah. And if, if it was the off chance where it was a real identity thief, you know, they would, they would probably realize that even with Windows, you know, there's always a password nowadays. Most people have passwords. So what, you, what are you going to do? You're going to yank the hard drive, you're going to slide it to another machine and hope that you get in that way. And as soon as you try to do this, it's going to come up, it's going to be unreadable. And you're going to have, most importantly, an unreportable event. It's also a good thing that Tom mentioned too. Um, these, uh, both these software and the, and the softwares like it were, uh, there was a, an article in the Washington Post, I think, that said that Princeton was doing 
lots of research on full disk encryption, and I figured out that if you do, there is a certain amount of time where the encryption key is stored in your RAM, so if you, the computer's on and you, you hit the power button, you freeze the RAM, you can, there's some way to read it. Um, so it's, it's not, it's nothing, you know, of course, in life is 100% um, accurate. There's someone who's going to be able to go in and, and do something if they really, really, really want to spend the time and the energy. Um, but we're thinking for us, if someone's going to do some kind of identity theft on trying to steal credit card number or you know, student social security numbers and addresses or something, they're not probably going to spend as much time on the laptop like you know the DoD needs to spend if you know there's some s weird secrets or something. Um, so you know there's always levels of security that you want to, to enforce, but it's not like you know, this is. <coughs> It, it has nothing to do with BitLocker. I, I don't remember having to physically do anything. I, you certainly can't use both at the same time. I don't remember having to, to turn, yeah. yeah cause it, and it doesn't touch the TPM module in the, in the computer or anything like that. Um, I don't necessarily remember having to turn anything off when I installed it on Vista. Um, I think it just, but I never, I didn't use it with BitLocker, so I'm not entirely sure. Did you test BitLocker on Vista? By itself, yes. But, uh, you know, I don't, don't trust use Vista. Okay. We also don't use Vista. Do it. We're not a Vista shop, so. And uh, we will probably never be. <laughs> we'll probably never be. And, and I think most companies will probably never be from this Vista shop either. It's the honest answer. Yes, it'll ask you a password before you can do anything, and it, re it over, right, Grub installs on? Well, you, well, Grub you can install wherever you want to install Grub, whether it's an S boot record or not, but you should think of this as being, this will replace whatever the master boot record, you know, loader is, and move that to its secondary position, and then just reference that and call that. Uh, what if you want to have an extra uh, layer of protection on a certain folder, say like, you know, financial record, or you know, some sort of confidential so that after you log in, once you're past that, um, then you'd have to add, enter this password every time you access that folder, or maybe it times out or something. Can you, does TrueCrypt have that feature, and could you use it if you're also doing full drive? Um, you could certainly, I mean, if you're running a full drive encryption on TrueCrypt, and then you wanted to create a TrueCrypt volume that was also encrypted, and I guess double the encryption, you could certainly do that. Um, I would probably even recommend that if you were even using CopySec and you were wanted to install a secondary level of encryption on a specific place, you could install TrueCrypt and boot a volume that had whatever you were looking for in it. Um, the um, individual um, encryption software for in CopySec to, in, to, in, to encrypt the specific file before you email it out uses the same um, encryption algorithms is what you install the drive at. So you would have to, e it's, not, it's not like a password you'd have to put in. If you email the file to someone else, they have to have your encryption keys that you're using, and then it will work. If, if they don't have those keys, then it won't work. But it's not something you could, you know, you put a password in. Uh, you would tr use TrueCrypt or something like that. Do you, do your you idea would be, uh, we do not. I mean, th th that would be targeting more, I, I would think, theft uh, by you know, either, let's say you're trying to protect the file from somebody else, like an admin. Let's say you're like, well, you know, my admin's got my password to my whole system, but I want to keep something private. Or if you were on the internet and you were using yeah. Internet Explorer yeah. or Safari or, or, or anything that was on there that would then be scanning your hard drive looking for those types of things. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely convinced of the utility of doing that because I think that uh, spyware that would be resonant on your system that is written today is it, not is going to like be the type that's going to continuously scan your hard drive. So once you decrypt that system, it, it, you know, let's say if I was writing this spyware, right, the way I would do it would 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 use you know, human, like you're going to decrypt that file at some point. If I have my spyware that's on your system and you haven't detected it, I'm going to get it. It's only a matter of time, right? 
if you, unless you never use it. And if you never use it, it's probably not that important. But, but here's the thing, do you honestly believe that there's a lot of people out there doing that, right? I mean, what do you think that spyware on your machine is doing? Do you think it's really looking for your, your <coughs> confidential data, or do you think it's sending spam? I mean, I mean let, let's, the honest answer here, right, is that, you know, you, you have to do this risk analysis with everything, right? I mean, w when you buy auto insurance, you do a risk analysis, right? When, when everything has to be this risk analysis that you have to do, because you can't become, nobody is. I mean, you, it, if we all say, wow, the, the academic environment is so much different than the corporate environment, right? Like, uh, we, we don't use firewalls, or we just started using firewalls, or we don't block all these ports, but corporations do. And then you go inside a corporate, a corporate network and they pass everything in clear text, right? You know, or, or, or something. So there's all these, these things that everybody does things a little bit different. Everybody has their policies for doing it a little bit differently. Um, you know, my personal pet peeve is, has anyone here ever heard of a reportable loss of data from Visa or MasterCard themselves? Anybody? But you hear it all the time, right? You? Yeah, I think, uh, I can't remember which, I think it was Chase or... No, 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 not, no, 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 not Chase, not that. Actually, Visa themselves. Visa or MasterCard themselves. Has anybody ever heard a reportable event from there? Anybody? Now let me ask you the question, do you think it doesn't happen? Or do you think that these two companies have some exclusion to the law that they don't have to report? I mean, it, it, you have to ask yourself these questions, right? That it, how does identity theft occur, right? If you read about it all the time, like you hear about TJ Maxx losing a million people's customer records, right? Have you ever heard about one of their records being compromised, any of those records? Do you think there's somebody somewhere who's like, you know, massing all of this data, right? I, I mean, I, I, I have to tell you an interesting story. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife's uh, Mac cart uh, gets billed like $600 in vitamins, right? So I, I go to the bank and I'm like, you know, obviously this is not the charge. And they're like, well, you know, it wasn't us. It was, you know, your wife's card must have been compromised somewhere. She must have used it somewhere. And you know, you, you know, it must have been like a waiter took it, or, or somebody took this, or somebody did this. And I said, well, okay, you know, I, I work with computers. Why don't you pull up on your computer there all the locations my wife has used her Mac card? And she looks at me funny, and she goes, well, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you keep that data. Look at it. She's like, why are you asking? And I said, because if you look at that, you'll see the only place she's ever used her card is at your Mac machine in this building. And she looks, and, and you know what she said to me at that point? Um, we're not supposed to tell anybody this, but Visa contacted us and they had an inside job and they lost 600,000 credit card numbers. Huh. Now, t to me, why didn't I read about that somewhere? You know, wh why didn't I see that? So I, I honestly, the, the, the answer comes down to what the, my personal belief here is that Visa and MasterCard, American Express, Discover, all of those companies are under some different rules than you and I are for reporting data. Because if any of you, for an instance, think that there's not an inside job that happens at Discover, at American Express, at Visa, or MasterCard, we're, we're human, after all, right? So I'm a little upset that we have to spend all this time doing this when, when the, the, the amount of proof of things like this that happen is very small. But major corporations, right? Do, do any of you, I mean, like, wow, like this is like, oh my God. Yeah, so anyway, I, I'm not a very happy camper. I, I love unfunded mandates, let me tell you. Like, oh, you have to do this, GLBA, then you know, the PCI spec. Like, every day it's like you get a new thing, and, and what we have to do is inconvenience our users more, and they don't understand why. And, and then you turn around and you hear things about, like, the, the big companies, you know. Uh, I guess, who knows, maybe Visa was getting ready for their IPO and they didn't want to admit that they had, you know, had a human being who said, hey, we'll give you $10,000 and you do a report, you know, or, or what have you. So uh, anyway, just all of you, something to think about. Um, yeah. just, just something else kind of similar to think about that I heard, I forget who I heard it from, because you know, you get bombarded by this stuff all the time from all different media sources. 
that um, the quote unquote bad guys in Eastern Europe or whatever place. They're always Eastern Europe. They're always Eastern, They're always Eastern, Eastern Europe. Europe. Or, or, All the bad guys. parties for Asia someplace. Right. So, one of those <laughs> but, so some of these mythical bad guys um, are collecting these vast numbers, these vast amounts of social security numbers and addresses, mother's maiden names and all that other PII, and they're not using them. Um, <clears throat> what they're doing, supp again, supposedly, okay, I have no proof of this, uh, is that they are waiting for people to, for the fraud alerts to expire, uh, for people to get tired of, you know, monitoring their credit reports, to stop paying LifeLock or whoever, and then three, five years down the line, then they're going to start using that information. Right, but you know, I heard that the LifeLock guy will go beat them up. Uh, he, he, he will go beat them he up. Will <laughs> or he'll send his cronies to go beat them up for you. Right, exactly. That, that's his business model, you know, of course. Um, but so, uh, so, you know, things like social security numbers, I mean, they tend not to expire. I mean, you know, people die and stuff like that. But, you know, generally three to five years from now, social security number is going to be about as good as it is today. You know, in many addresses, et cetera, dates of birth tend not to change on people. Um, you know, so, I, again, and I don't want to spread FUD, but... Again, that's just something I've heard that sounds plausible. You know that uh, you know that 90-day fraud alert. Oh, great. Okay, so they're going to wait until you know three to five years from now. So that's not going to right. But I, I, if you are a criminal, right? I mean, and, and you have access to this data, and you buy, let's say, vitamins, right? Like, like, like to, to me, the whole thing here, right, is okay. Who is this vitamin company that has a merchant account to, to begin with? Because obviously, there's fraud going on. Like, I mean, just, there's just, it, it blows my mind that, you know, a anybody can get a merchant account, and, you know, and, and you can ship it. Because obviously, you know, how else is there fraud there? Like, is it mom and pop company in the middle Midwest who will write you a check w when you say, oh, I don't want them? No, they're going to refund it to your credit card. So I, I think that, that there's that possible scenario. They're waiting. They're, they're waiting for this. But, you know, I, I think that historically, if that was true, they would see, there would be some evidence of this pattern of this waiting happening. And I, I don't really think it's about creating identities. Like suddenly, you no longer live here, you live in you know, Nigeria, right? I mean, obviously there's gonna be a fraud alert there. I, I think what the honest answer is what these people are doing is they're using stolen credit cards numbers, you know? And, and they're using them right away to continue to live their, their lifestyle, you know? Or they're, you know, doing whatever they want. They're, they're prohibiting online gaming right, overseas because of the, this massive fraud. But the honest answer, of course, is that the Las Vegas and Atlantic City and everybody else are upset that there's, you know, and so there, and, and then there's now these international trade issues and everything else with online gambling. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's more to it. Uh, well, th there's, uh, th there's the PCI security standard Right? Does everybody know what that is? It's like a payment processing. Like, it's uh, if you deal with credit cards at all in any way, you have. We can't discuss, but we don't know. Right? Does anyone here? If you deal with credit cards, you have to complete it. I I would say just from our experience, just ask general counsel where you are because they're the ones who always come down with the stuff on us. Right, and then you have like the, the uh, uh, you know, it depends. Like uh, some schools have to, uh, what well, you have the Graham Lucky, Graham Leach, Graham. yeah, yeah, HIPAA. you know, HIPAA. You have the PCI stuff if you take credit cards. Uh, I my my opinion is is that uh, if you are in a responsible area and you fall to that type of stuff, then you would have to, you would be aware of it, especially the PCI of credit card data, and what have you. The, the paperwork gets more complex. You know, every year. Yeah, you know, I, I've been doing it for years now, and it's like here it's a half-page form, it's a two-page form, it's a six-page form, it's a twenty-page form. It's like, you know. What I, what I do have is a clinic server with clients' social security numbers on it that is not sitting. That's just sitting out there. Right. Probably that would be GLBA for the most part. Say what? GLBA, the gram. Yeah, yeah, thing that you would be, that you would have to look at for that. And what are you doing about students who are accessing, who are using that data? I mean, are you... Oh, well, we don't have any students. Yeah, no. Right, we don't have any students. Uh, well, you know, the, the interesting dilemma, the interesting dilemma, right, is that you, you face a couple different aspects of it, like especially us, right, is you have these students who have their personal own laptops who want to be working on these case files. And so it's like trying to tell our clinical director, you know, you have to make sure 
They, they really shouldn't be using their laptops. The data should remain here on the clinic computers that we provide that have our uh, you know, network security and everything else involved in them. But again, like I said with everything else, is we are human. You, you know, so I, I think that how you save yourself in that respect is by just having a policy. You know, if, if you have a, a printed policy, you know, in terms of, now granted, would it be a reportable event, right? Like, who wants to be the one that a student has copied files to their uh, personal laptop, client files, and then loses their laptop? Their laptop is stolen. W what are you going to do if they graduate from law school and four years later they've never cleaned off their laptop hard drive, their laptop is stolen? We don't even know about that. You know, no one's going to tell us. You know, so what become, how do we enforce that? How do we police that? We, we honestly, we don't. Right? You, you can't. So w what you need to do is, is you need to have a policy and, and hope that, that, you know, that that's, I mean, or, or we come to this environment where we're like, we're going to turn off USBs, we're not going to have floppy drives, you know, we're going to disable all this stuff, we're going to make it impossible, we're not going to give you access to email on these computers, you're going to be able to work on this file, but you're not going to be able to send this file anywhere, it's going to be stuck here. So. Any other questions? Okay. What's up? Well, thank you very much. Hope you uh, found it fun.
if you were using an iMac 